Good evening, all of you. I'm the one that is called Freek. Um, it's the first time that people don't mispronounce my name. Normally they call me Freek. Um, <laughs> this is Johan. Um, it's our first time to give a lecture together. Um, so we work daily together, you could say, but giving a, a talk together is um, something we don't often do. Um, we, we thought of taking the advantage of being here tonight in this wonderful venue which has so much in common with the uh, uh, venue or the building that we will talk about. We thought it as a real opportunity to, um, to come and uh, talk together. Um, so it's a, a kind of live experiment that you will see. Um, so we are indeed here today coming from Brussels, um, which used to be very close to London which is becoming increasingly far. Um, the name of our office, which is called 51 and 4 e which is the exact location of Brussels, more or less. So 51 North, 4 East. And um, tonight we want to discuss and also uh, debate, um, imagine, uh, about how to not demolish a building. Um, in order to do that, it's important to understand a bit where we are coming from. So we will, I will shortly situate what we are doing so that we can talk about this case of the World Trade Center uh, afterwards. So there you see Brussels indicated. So it's indeed uh, here. Um, it's part of the, what you call the, the blue banana. So the most productive uh, region in uh, Europe. But also, m because of that productivity, or maybe despite that productivity, a very fragmented uh, region. And so, um, this is an image of an artist friend of mine, which is called Landscape of My Personal Belongings. And actually looking at the built environment of the Blue Banana looks um, yeah, surprisingly a lot like this. So, yeah, for us, this is a driving question. How come in an area where the productivity is so uh, strong that fragmentation is produced. And we are um, really wondering about the, how inhabitable, inhabitable this area is. So it could be productive, but it's, is it also inhabitable? And how can we make environments? How can we make places for people to live? And there's something we can contribute to architecture, but obviously this question goes way beyond architecture. And it might be something that we also discuss tonight. Um, we're a group of, a, a growing group of people. Um, by now we are 75 people in Belgium and more or less 15, 20 in Albania. Um, people coming f mainly from Europe, um, but from different parts in Europe. There's people from Belgium, lots of people from Italy, from France, also from the Balkans, from Serbia, Bosnia, Greece, um, also from Italy. So let's say we're largely a, um, a very young group of people. I turn out to be one of the oldest, unfortunately. Sometimes we work together with older people, but it's maybe challenging to uh, get them inside the structure of the office, which we often try, but economically it's challenging. Let's say people are here in our office to learn, um, to invest, and that, that's something that we try to offer as much as we can. Um, this, the structure has started as a kind of traditional architecture office and is growing now in a more complex ecosystem, as we call it, uh, dealing with different questions and also structuring ourselves uh, through different studios. And the questions we deal with have a lot to do with the kind of environment that we have inherited. For instance, this flyover. Um, and we work with infrastructure, with architecture, and we try to do so in a way that we try to get different perspectives on the question, making us experiment with different ways of working together. Um, we do this, for instance, a lot um, by trying to set up common experiences so this is not a design, so this is not a mock-up of a design, but more a mock-up of what kind of different atmosphere you could generate. Um, we work also in Albania and we 
work a lot with refurbishment. So this is a public space, but in essence, it's a refurbishment of an environment that has existed since 150 years and that we are adapting, we're adding a layer to it. This layer is quite a drastic one. We made a car-based space into a pedestrian space, but basically it's about refurbishment, adaptive reuse. Um, this doesn't stop us from being busy with very, let's say, traditional Flemish Belgian questions. This is a, a house at the back of an existing house, like urban fabric. Um, this also is a big question in Belgium about suburbia, about areas which are, are very loosely built, which we try to densify. This is a, a building which you might say is inspired by the Crescent in Bath. It's um, uh, collective housing, uh, partly for the elderly. So it's in our work we often com are confronted with questions that deal with how society is changing. And working in Albania, we um, are also confronted with the society in a very different moment in their lifespan. Um, so in Belgium, you could say maybe also in London, somehow it's maybe a more mature adult and maybe an almost senile environment. In Albania, it's very vibrant and young, so everything that we do is constantly contradicted by working in these different places, uh, which keeps us very fresh and very alive, but it's also quite challenging because the thing that you believe in in Brussels might be totally wrong in Tirana and vice versa. Um, because in Brussels, we inherit a lot of existing building stock, which is considered worthless, but we don't think so. Um, so this is, for instance, an IBM tower um, built in the, in the 70s, which in this picture is uh, vacant. And um, because we work on, um, um, in this kind of complex um, situation, um, we had decided to start to share a bit more what it means to deal with those complexities. And also maybe a bit in, um, um, out of um, annoyance with this kind of abundance of monographs on architecture, we started to make a series of multigraphs um, showing projects, for instance, the Skanderbeg Square in Tirana, through the lens of all of the people that have been busy with it and looking at all of the things that have been happening. So not just at the results, not just at the architecture, but also at many different layers. And we have, in that sense, started a series of um, chapters, we call them, chapters on transformation, where we try to openly share what we learn, and um, also in the, the idea to make it very available and to start to share in, uh, with, with the ambition to just contribute and also uh, inspire to deal with architecture in a different way. Um, so two of them, this one, the Skanderbeg Square, and this one on the World Trade Center, are more case study books. The middle one is called Design and Dialogue, where we try to talk about an aspect which, I th which we think is quite normal um, to design and dialogue. It's nothing special. But for some reason, it's decided not to be talked about. And um, it's in that sense also a bit taken away from the realm of architecture and put into the field of the urban facilitators, uh, which is fine, but which is for us not enough because we feel that design can contribute a lot to how you deal with um, yeah, situations of learning together, working together. And we feel this is really a topic that everyone has something to say about, um, but it should just get a platform. And so this is our contribution to it. The one on the, um, on the World Trade Center is the one we would like to talk about today. It's a, it's a book that has been published a, a few weeks ago, even if the building is far from finished. So um, I think we're now in the maybe 60, 70% of the construction site. And so the reason to start to share it today and talk about it today is because this has been a case study for us which has been so uh, amazing to learn about all of these things. Um, and we thought it was also given the state of a vacancy in Brussels, it's really important to share it now and not when the building is finished. Uh, we lose, of course, 
the joy of having a beautiful book with amazing, I think it will be amazing um, interiors, for instance. But we, what we gain is that we can set up a conversation which doesn't show any result and in that sense explicitly focuses on the process. Um, it's a book that is financed by four uh, parties. It's us, it's um, Jaspers Eiers, which is an architect from Brussels. It's La UC, an architect from Paris. And it's Befimo, which is the investor of the, of the building. And so the four of us have decided to equally invest in this publication, um, which is in itself, I think, a very beautiful testimony to an ambition that we share. Um, as you can imagine, it's, it's, quite, it's, a, it's a big building. I don't know how, how to express it in square feet, but it's uh, 100,000 square meters uh, of uh, building on, above ground and underground. And our experience and our engagement with it, we have unraveled in five uh, tracks, which are five processes which run in parallel. Some have started earlier, some later, some are, will be finished, others will be not. And we have found that somehow it's um, actually in every situation where you have to deal with refurbishment of a building which has some iconic value and some triggers some collective memory, it's actually things that you could learn from. So firstly, I maybe quickly situate, deal with the trauma. Um, this is the North District that I was, uh, that, um, that the building is situated in. So the building is standing here. Um, but it's part of a bigger redevelopment plan of the 60s, 70s. Uh, you have to imagine that before um, this urban fabric that you see in the foreground continued. Um, and so um, in the 70s, there was the decision to prepare for the future, a decision done by developers, by the Belgian states, and also by a group of planners. Um, imagining a future that is not unlike futures anywhere else in the world uh, at that uh, same period in time. Um, place for cars, place for public domain, kind of towers which are in a way a bit thought like computers. It's like platforms of information where you can exchange World Trade Center part of a global international network of production and extraction. Um, in that sense, uh, Brussels puts itself globally on the map, part of a World Trade Center in, um, in New York. Um, and the whole imagination looks extremely seamless. It's a bright, easy, convenient future, which is in stark contrast with the reality of trying to produce, produce those environments because obviously Brussels is not empty and was also not empty back then. Um, so here you see the North District again, the World Trade Center 1 and 2 being built, and here, while they are being built and being inhabited, the neighborhood that was there, which was one of the most uh, popular neighborhoods in, um, um, in uh, Brussels, a very vibrant working class neighborhood, slowly being demolished step by step. So um, the contrast between these two images is rather shocking because in a way you could say in other cities there was the war or there was real dramatic events. Here there was just an explicit choice to evict 11,000 people. And so the reaction was also very violent, very strong, um, luckily so. Um, you could say what this neighborhood sparked is maybe the birth of civil society organizing itself in Brussels. Um, the largest mural of Brussels at the time you see here at the boulevard, with, uh, which was meant to become a highway. So uh, a very conflictual situation. And here you see, for instance, how that counter movement um, and also the rise of postmodern architecture. Um, so the reconstruction de la ville, the reconstruction of the city, uh, somehow filling the void which, with, um, with a built substance, which is somehow the content of the World Trade Center, but the form supposedly of the traditional city. So a very confused environment, a very um, paradoxical environment, and also an environment which is um, becoming largely vacant. So at, in the, let's say five years ago, um, 
You see all of the leases of the buildings. These buildings were made as products for big companies, also later administration, leases of 30 years, very stable investment products. So all of these investment products are becoming obsolete. And the question is, what do you do with an obsolete investment product? And of course, back then, um, Befimo, um, the investor that I was talking about, was inventing the next cycle of investment, the next cycle of uh, capturing revenue. Uh, they, they are a real estate company that is on the stock exchange, so they have they, they basically offer stable investments for people around the world. And um, they were imagining, so this is a competition by five international companies producing things like this, which is somehow how capitalism imagines um, the future today. Um, green, um, twice as much square meters. And for some reason they realized themselves that they really didn't want this, that it was not credible, that it was harmful, that it was, so they had um, with the CEO, um, Olivier de Blic, um, they had some uh, kind of crisis of, of conscience that they said, this will not work, this is not realistic. And so they started um, to rethink that what, what they were doing. And at the same time, in that area, one of the biggest uh, migrant crises, so people that didn't want to come to Belgium but just wanted to pass through Belgium were Vacate, were somehow inhabiting the park and the boulevard, etc. Uh, another cycle of civil society organizing itself, taking care of these people. So just to say that the image of that area is extremely negative. The capacity to imagine a future or a potential in that area was close to zero. So it's the the, Bel the Brussels government was saying to the developers, you have been dealing with that area for 30 years. If it's failing, don't come to us, solve your own problems. So a very dramatic situation. And um, we were somehow thinking that that dramatic situation is potentially very interesting because if people are so desperate, the, um, it's a bit like what people say that sometimes changes in society happen like someone turning in his bed uh, at night. Before you know it, you are in a totally different direction. And somehow this is what we were dreaming of or hoping for, or at least intrigued by. Um, and so we started, we negotiated with Defimo to uh, do a two week workshop in the towers. Um, this was happening in World Trade Center one. Um, and this is an image of the foot of the tower today, representing the, society, the people that inhabit Brussels uh, these days. Um, and so over the period of just a year and a half, you could say, from 2000, half 2017 till end of 2018, we were able to inhabit the towers. We inhabited it um, by starting with this workshop a workshop on hybrid business districts uh, with students on site, also organizing a public program, also organizing a discussion salon with, uh, with uh, investors and the group of other owners around them. And so thanks to the CEO, we were able to invite them in and they were interested, they were ready to listen, ready to listen to students, uh, absolutely amazing. Um, and um, from that work, we, um, in, and in the discussion, we formulated an experiment that we could run together with them. And that's to try and, so this, if this is the kind of a, a district of large companies, big uh, leases, to somehow take a segment of space that is available and to try a different model, but not necessarily to focus on housing or to focus on other programs, but just focusing on how could you diversify, let's say, lease of office floors? Diversifying by difference in scale, difference in organizations, what if you would invite schools, what if you would invite social organizations, but all in the realm of office, you could say. So there, the idea of hybrid business district. And how did we test this? We could uh, activate the 
top part of the World Trade Center one, activating mean to activate the machines again, to, because yeah, this is the middle of the tower, this is where the technical um, plant is. There's one at, uh, at the middle and one at the top. So one part of the building could be activated. And um, they were open to test for a year and a half to fill these floors with other uses. Obviously, also in their mind, to attract, again, attention to the area. Um, we're fully aware of that. But nevertheless, offering um, this space to be used for people at the cost of just the technical equipment running. Um, and fully staffing it from their side with security, with maintenance people, etc. And this um, started by the idea of doing it for one floor, two floors. Uh, but very quickly, this open call that we launched became extremely successful. Um, and the way we launched it was to say, you get a space at a very low rate for this year and a half, but you have to do something in return for the neighborhood. And the thing in return ranged in very diverse ways. So you had people just making a playground, uh, very minimal, very cute, very charming, but also um, activist groups in Brussels, like Pool is Cool, they organized the, you, the reuse for two days of the fountain on the roundabout of the district, finding out actually that it has the same capacity as the Plan d'eau in Bordeaux, so it's actually a beautiful public facility. It's just not accessible because cars are driving around it daily. Some of the interventions became more layered and became more um, somehow, yeah, somehow projects in their own right. So this is um, the activation of the rooftop on the third floor, the former public domain for years and accessible, that somehow local organizations, the farm close by, people from the offices, also people from the Flemish administration, somehow all joining together to make this urban garden possible. So this was done with no budget, no funds, just by their um, enthusiasm and initiative. Um, at the same time, also the architectural workroom in Brussels was collaborating with the uh, Architecture Biennale in Rotterdam and decided to organize an exhibition in the space, an exhibition related to the Sustainable Development Goals. This is um, the uh, exhibition designed by OQRM in London, um, where, you, where they phrase it very beautiful, the building is the stage, the building is the test site, and the building is the exhibition. And so this plays out very beautifully the, uh, all the ambiguities that were happening in this year and a half. And here you see, for instance, the reception area, which uh, pictures the northern half of the globe, which is already very telling in itself. Um, and so in the span of a year and a half, we went from things that looked extremely institutional, very profound, with a lot of de demonstrative qualities, uh, full on, but also extremely informal. This is a picture of the last uh, festival called uh, Festival Illegal, which was like all the youth of Brussels suddenly assembling in the old shopping center uh, in the basement of the tower. And so it became more than just um, a temporary use. It became really a social movement in the city. All of the discussions were somehow gearing around it. People started to experience the building and actually appreciate it, including the investor himself or themselves, because obviously it's a group of people. And so suddenly they saw these buildings in a new light. They saw people happy coming there. They saw people enjoying being there and it somehow really flipped around the perception of the, of the, of the place dramatically. Um, it also allowed uh, discussions to really come to the fore. So I was talking about Jaspers Eiers, um, which is this uh, big firm in Brussels that builds most of the office real estate. So suddenly the students were critiquing Jaspers Eiers, um, and in the elevators you would, they would come there and they would see actually we are not wanted. So discussions that were normally happening in separate rooms, the investors more used to be living in the south of Brussels, 
suddenly came really to the north. Um, and so it was really a, a place where all of this contradiction came to life. And I think what, what, what we managed to do in this year and a half was really to rewire part of the trauma into something that was offering glimpse of the future. And I think what is important about this drawing is that it's not things in dramatic cuts. It's not saying, okay, just like they did with the popular neighborhood 50 years ago, this is a bad neighborhood, it's, it's really worthless, to not do the same again with the office district and to somehow appreciate it for what it's worth and to try and learn how to see it. And, um, and, and yeah, so we were somehow discovering a lot on the go um, and we were ourselves also confronted with things that we didn't expect, which was an architectural competition, which was launched um, in the, I think, third or fourth month that we were in the building. Also the moment where we got in contact with uh, Jaspers Eyers, and this competition was a competition to rethink the towers, the towers that we were inhabitants of, uh, the towers that we started to love, and the competition was explicitly asking to demolish the whole building and to replace it with a mixed-use program. Um, in itself, mixed-use, a good brief, but the heartbreak by then of um, yes, somehow ex expecting these towers to be demolished made us um, yeah, somehow very conflictuous whether we should join this architectural competition or not. And now I'll give the word to you. <laughs> A seamless transition. <laughs> and so, like Freek said, we moved in that area um, with all our office at that moment um, to have a temporary office in that place. So we were like nomads in the city. And being confronted then with, uh, after three months, with the question of a competition, would you join? Uh, there was a big debate internally. We decided, of course, you cannot else than join that competition. But indeed, under the condition that we would start from keeping the building, start from what is there, and then see where we go from. Um, um, actually, we passed two competitions. First, the competition was of the, the, the development company, the, um, the investment fund, to find an architect to rethink the building. And then they were planning to go in a second competition because they want to offer the project to a long lease to the Flemish government, who want, they want to attract for, um, to lease the project for, I think, 18 years. So, we were first selected as the winning team to refurbish the concept of the building and then we had together with the development company to convince the lease of the Flemish government. And so this is a picture of an atelier, a design atelier that we have installed in the 15th floor. So our office was there, all the engineers came there. I think in the second competition we were about 90 people working we were every two days a week, we were there with the whole team in different workshops. And so this competition took a, about one year to come up with a solid concept of the refurbishment of uh, that project. So in a way to be able to make um, a, a development company make an offer that is solid, it took us one and a half year study to evaluate the pros and the cons of, um, of the project. Um, and we were, in the beginning, we were selected because we kept it. And we were trying to, with very carefully means, to see what we could keep and what not. And what would, um, how we would change the function over time from 100% office building into a more diverse uh, uh, program. And so, the concept is at this stage where we, um, on the left side, you see the situation in 72. It's a, a, a 
two towers built on a four floors plinth with five levels of garage underneath which are uh, founded on um, Piloti. And so our project uh, in the end connects the two towers, but first we keep um, the two main shafts, the, the circulation shafts, all the underground infrastructure, but the plinth we demolish because the plinth was really like a wall towards the city. And we really wanted to open and to turn the building inside out because in the World Trade Center you go in, in the lobby, and from there you go to all the places. In fact, we wanted the city to be the lobby with many doors. Um, and so therefore we decided also to, although we could have kept it, uh, demolish that. And so we connect the two buildings, the two old buildings with one volume. Um, and so you get the Z shape. And in the two armpits, we have two uh, lower uh, buildings, um, which are mainly public functions. There are several reasons of this plan. Um, because in a way, in, I show you a result, but it's an extremely difficult jigsaw puzzle why we did it. Um, I tried to explain a few reasons of that. One thing was that the Flemish government say, forget it, we're not going back in a tower. A tower is like 1,500 square meter, and to have a collaborative working environment, we want to be horizontal. We don't want to be vertical. You get lost in a space. Um, so what we did here is we connected the two floors, uh, the two towers in one large space of about 5,000 square meter. I'm sorry, I'm talking in meters. Um, um, which allows for many different um, departments to work in a horizontal way. So this is not a tower. I think maybe Belgium is the only country where you can say a tower is not a tower. Um, so where you had before 30 floors, now we have 15 floors of these horizontal surfaces. In a way, the surface is 100 meter long. Uh, in the middle, it's 25 meters large. You don't have any vertical circulation or shafting. Um, so you're quite free to organize um, everything what you need in different plan systems. And especially because in the middle, we connect the two towers every other floor. Because one disadvantage of the um, office buildings is that the floors are really built to a minimal height. Um, in order to compensate the height, in order to attract more daylight, um, we found the opportunity to connect the towers every other floor. Like that, you have a large space, and in the middle, you are with a lot of uh, space, and when you go in the tower, it's more intimate. So something which was not seen as qualitative becomes suddenly a nice difference. Um, because of that effect, you get daylight really until deep in the middle um, in those 25 meters large space. So today the situation, today's use of that building is um, in pink office. So you have 14, I think, floors, horizontal floors. And of course you see the color blue and green. Blue is the housing, which is sitting almost like a mezzanine in between the floors. Those are the floors which are not connected to the central um, space. Um, so housing towards the park and 15 hotel floors towards the main station, railway station. So these are the mezzanine floors in between the uh, large scale. Um. So it's a building where almost like a zebra scheme, um, you both have office housing, office housing, office housing on top of each other. Um, so this is an image of one of the apartments towards the park. And that's not the today situation, it's a, a collage of the project. We did not want to deliberately, for example, make explicit this zebra into the architecture. We rather wanted to look for a facade which 
really takes into itself the hybridity between what is office and housing, trying to create a building that is best of both worlds, which is almost the sum of the restrictions, conditions, but also the qualities of what an office is and what a housing building is. So large terraces, not only for the housing, but also for the offices. Openable windows, not only for the offices, uh, for the housing, but also for the offices. So also the um, climatological, uh, technical, acoustical uh, aspects. So you could say this building is a bit overdimensioned in quality in order for, for the vision to be adaptable in time. So we would like to avoid that these buildings, in order to change them, have to be broken down in the future. Uh, therefore, we think, but you never can predict the future, um, that the adaptability in the future is more guaranteed by already now try to integrate the, um, the scenarios. So an apartment building can become an office building and vice versa. And yet, because of the zebra, also we have separated flows of people because you cannot allow somebody going to his office to meet somebody in the apartments. We do that because we use the same shaft. So it's the existing old shaft. We don't extend it. Um, because of the people entering in different levels, they don't meet each other. They have their own elevators, their own stairways. Um, but because they use it the same, but on top of each other, but never in section in the same place. So people in the office don't meet the people in the apartments. Also, by reducing the amount of office floors by half, we could eventually live with the same amount of elevators because the standards are, of course, incredibly increased today than it was in 74. So all this together led to a way that we could just, in this building, use the same shafts as before, not add anything. And so the facade becomes an extremely normal building, but inside you have a lot of technicalities, the terraces both for office and uh, housing, the facades for office and housing, openable facades. Um, and towards the park, for example, all the balconies are open. So the feeling of that as an office building that all of a sudden opens to this side, um, Changes. So it's in the detail, in small things that the building tells you I'm something hybrid or different. And then in that armpit, we have a lower building in order to link with the scale of the environment. So big and small can be right at each other. So there is no problem, big and small in the same position, if you make the scenario quite well. The rooftop is shared by all, is accessible for both office, housing and um, a hotel function, which is 360. We don't have many rooftops. Uh, you have a better tradition than we in Brussels. Um, so I think these are one of the first ones um, that we will open. That's a today's situation. Uh, at the end of the year, uh, the Flemish government would like to go in the building. So you see actually here where is the entrance of the office building, there is the entrance of the housing, so instead of making one big block, the building is really fragmented in different pieces, but it's still one lease. The adaptability would be destroyed if the building would get sold in pieces. So also the development company wants to keep it in order to guarantee the future adaptability. Another important process is that we, when we started, it was literally the first time I heard about circularity. So this is something that we have learned over the past three years in a drastic way. It was the Flemish government who really took the lead in there and to put a really high standard. We went together with them to Holland because that was uh, the first, uh, they are very strong in that already. And um, maybe I'll show you how we learned that process a bit. So we were living in that building already, and we were already trying, you see the window up there? Um, I think that's the floor where we were, and we were trying, yeah, what can we do with the building, how we do it, and we were trying to at least 
take out one glass, put another glass in and have an openable window and to see what is an openable window in this height because everybody's complaining about wind pressure velocity. I wanted to feel for myself if this is doable or not. I don't trust engineers on their papers. I think I trust, I, I rather trust actioneers. Um, so we got the permission to do it. We tried to keep the floors because it's a um, beautifully, minimally designed uh, uh, steel structure. Um, I think the architects did a really good job there. But because of its minimal design, it's also not very adaptable for different uses. And so in the end, we had to decide, uh, a bit with pain in the heart, to demount the, all the floors, just keep the shafts, to guarantee that in the future the building is much more easier to adapt. Um, what we did with the concrete, that's a really nice primer. Um, we demounted the concrete, we transported it to the canal nearby, um, we crushed it, and I mean, if you say we, it's a collection of different companies. Eh? I did not do that. Um, we tested it, we reused it, and we brought it back to site. So in that sense, it's a whole circle of um, analyzing what's the quality of concrete on site, taking it to the factory, crushing it, taking out the steel, making it even smaller in smaller bits and pieces, um, using it in new concrete. For every lot, we do tests what is the capacity of it, and then sending it back on site and using it again uh, in uh, floorings and some columns. We did not use it in beams. Uh, therefore, the quality was uh, degraded too much. And gradually, step by step, we started to do it with all of the products. So we have to reason in ton. So the building is 274,000 ton, as it was. We used, reused, because we kept on site 62%, so about 170 ton, 1,000 ton, is still there. We don't touch it, we don't break it out. 1% small things, uh, furnitures, has been sold for low prices to schools, uh, to other, and 31% is taken out, recycled, and brought back, or brought back to other projects. 6% is really waste and is polluted, so we had to dump it. If you look at the new building, the new building is heavier than the old one. It's 315,000 ton. We managed to recuperate 70% of the weight uh, of the new building by old material. And, we, uh, and that was a request of the Flemish government, is that 99% of the new materials coming in are C2C accredited. So it means that they are controlled on how pollutive they are, uh, what, what will be the afterlife of materials, how, of what are they produced. Um, and there was first a process on how to test them, what kind of uh, criteria we, we will use. Um, and the, all that process get step by step really systemized. Collecting all the materials, all the tiles uh, were selected, they were packed, they were sent to the construction site, cleaned, and then brought back uh, to the site. So all this process of reuse was done yeah, because we were excited somehow by the first time to do it. Um, the whole building was listed, so we knew exactly what material was there and where it was going and how much. Um, and so all that process was actually new to us. And you feel that this is a chain that you are changing because it's a whole building system, um, both production, but also the aftercare that companies have and how those materials are treated and retaken. And so there are a lot of companies that we took with us in that uh, thinking. Um, because of the big scale, we could create that interest. You don't, you're not able to do that for a building of 1,000 square meter, but for a building of 100,000 square meter, companies are willing to uh, at least to do the effort for the first primer. Also energy, it's a local energy um, uh, 
community. Because of the different functions, we reuse uh, the energy, so demand and offer of energy is being technically is possible, is easy. More difficult is even contract-wise how to deal with that. And that was another experiment. Um, it's how to make nice environments because if we have this height and we have this light, we could maybe bring in some nice green environments. And since we were living in that building already, we were testing it also. So there is a whole series of events parallel happened to our architectural process um, that are more busy with the environment. Um, since we were living there, we were making green gardens inside of the building because we wanted to test how plants may survive, even birds may survive or not. Um, and, and this was one of the most favorite meeting rooms. And through that testing, it got into the project. Um, and many tests we did in order to see if plants can, what kind of plants survive with minimal daylight, with kind of dry situations that an office is because a plant wants humidity and we want dry and how you combine it and is that combinable, what kind of insects we get and, and from there we have now in the project a test running uh, with I think about 1000 plants, 400 trees, then we will see how this will grow uh, in the future. Because we have floors which are, because of our height, the floor is a 70 centimeter uh, void. And so we have a lot of space for the roots to grow under the floor. Um, and so these high floors, this is the entrance where the lobby of the, hotel, of the offices are. Uh, there will become also a part of it with a green park. Um, left you see the, the greenhouse. That's also a nice space. So there is 2,000 square meter open green space and this belongs to nobody in the building. This is to give the city an address in the project. So it's a very high space and you see the wall is open towards the city. So it will be open during the day. Uh, of course in the night it closes, uh, during the weekend. And we have managed in the program of all the functions to get all the program that is shareable with the city to put it down in the ground floor and to make it connected to each other, which means that the auditorium, uh, polyvalent rooms, uh, sports room are there and the lobby of the greenhouse, which is actually the address of the city in the building, connects to that. So which means that after office hours, this building can stay open uh, and can be used for uh, other uses. I think this is the hotel lobby, uh, both having an address to the street and inside of the greenhouse. And then we were testing, as Freak showed, uh, how we already are engaging into the public space because that's the covered public space. I think the next step today, there is no master plan of public space here. I think with architecture, you can do urbanism. And that's where we have engaged uh, and we created an VZ2, it's a kind of non-profit organization, Lab North. Um, and that organization is actually organizing different activities in the neighborhood, is uh, trying to make alliances with different organizations in order to advocate for the vast open space that we have. There is a lot uh, to make it, to demineralize it to turn it into a more park-like environment and to create better addresses and to inspire other buildings when they are refurbishing to make the address to the street uh, or yeah, to the public space, which is not a good public space today. The architects may forget that it can change in the future and if they do it now in their design, it will fasten the process of redesign also public space. We are organizing movie nights and events with this uh, non-profit organization. So that's for us also something parallel. Besides the architecture, which is nice and fun to do, also to make sure that the city follows uh, with the same ambition level. 
So I think the roles, and that's actually what the book tries to do, to show how many different roles we take as designers, as people who have imagination, who are making relationships uh, with others, who dream of what can be next, is to at least communicate about these things because that is so value to, valuable to us rather than only the result. The result is important because people need tangible things to believe. But to wait many years for an urban plan to get into place or for a building for years to get alive, no, it's important to act today, to have small tangible results in order to create the community around. And last week when I was on the construction site, you see this, and then I think, fuck what we are doing. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm pretending how not demolish a building, and I see all these things in the building, all these new materials, and it's, it's huge. Um, so I think that the question is very valuable. Um, um, but I'm not sure if we went far enough with the project of Zin at this moment. At least for us, it's, it changes a lot. Um, and I would like to maybe show you one fact. Um, we are involved in many other refurbishment projects. Um, and this is just a simple life cycle analysis of one of the buildings. This building is 5,000 square meters. Um, and what does this gram shows, the graph shows? It shows the carbon use of a building. And there are four scenarios. So it's an existing building. The first two are a refurbishment. The last two are we break it down and we build it new. Um, that's the two scenarios. The first two it calculates over a period of 60 years the CO2 emissions that we create when we refurbish. In the light gray, you have the operational emission, which means it's all the, the heating, the, the energy you use for maintaining and heating your building. The dark gray is the carbon you use, the CO2 you use, just because of the materials you buy and the replacement over the period of 60 years. So just to understand the graph. So in the light renovation, what you do is um, you put a heat pump, you put um, solar panels, because that's what you do. Uh, and you in order to be able to occupy the building, you do light renovations here and there for materials to replace windows. They are the most weak parts. Um, maybe some roofing you change, and, and that's the emission over 60 years. On the right side is you demolish, you make a concrete structure, and you build a new. The second one is when you, that's a bit what we did in the Zin project. You demolish your building, only the structure remains, the facade stays, I'm sorry, the facade you change, and means that your energy can be much more performant. So you have less um, carbon emissions in your operational cost. And the third one is a new building, but in a wood construction, a much more uh, environmental friendly. So you see between the first and the last one, you have about 23% of difference in emissions. But now it gets interesting. If you put that in time, and that's, this key. So in the year one, you build your project. Um, so you have carbon that comes free. Then your line goes slightly up. That's because you heat the building. After 20 years, you have to do a refurbishment, a renovation. And then it grows again. This surface is the impact on your global warming. If you compare this with a scenario of a refurbishment, this is the light refurbishment you almost do the essentials in the beginning. Of course, your operational carbon goes steeper high up because you, you are less energy efficient. And then after 20 years, you do the same changes. Your sun panels have to change and so on. Um, even when maybe you might have some more refurbishment uh, in that process. 
The surface is the impact uh, on the CO2 on your environment, which means that even by reusing, almost doing nothing, but with a worse energy system, you have much less, around 45% less impact on the global warming. Even, and I think that is quite essential. Uh, it, it's, it's almost to say that you should do a moratorium on demolishing. On, on, uh, you cannot do that. It's never good to say you cannot do it, but you should at least have a very, very good scheme uh, and at least be convincing on many dimensions, both social and on ecological, if you want to decide to destruct the building. I think that's telling us. Um, so from there, I think, um, Drake, you take it. <laughs> 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 yeah, indeed, because in a way what we would like to discuss today is um, really a plea for being militant about it altogether. And in a way you could say the ZIN project, the World Trade Center project that we showed tonight, to a certain extent is almost like a counterexample. And also in the office there's very mixed feelings about, yeah, did we have to refurbish those buildings so drastically? Couldn't we keep it as it was because it was actually extremely nice and extremely engaging to be there. And the reason why we decided not to wait until the end to communicate about the building is because many things have happened along the way, and this is one of them. So this is a tower just uh, a few hundred meters away from the World Trade Center. It's called the IBM Tower. It's a building, again, from the 70s, a building that somehow is very present in the collective Im Im imagination of Brussels, but also a building which is highly problematic. I mean, it has a very, let's say, it's, for a developer, it's very difficult to lease it because it has a negative connotation. Uh, the entrance, for instance, is here on the side. So the relation to the urban fabric is really, um, yeah, almost non-existent. <clears throat> and through the pro project of the World Trade Center, we got to know very young developers, um, let's say younger than us, um, who wanted to challenge the real estate market. And they are called downtown, and they, are, they were saying, Adaptive reuse is our agenda. So we will challenge the market by working differently. And so they were inspired by the World Trade Center and what we did with it. And we started to talk together about this building, which was in a way relatively, because it's a very big building, but relatively cheap. Also because the area it sits in is like on the edge of things, of many things. And so we started to discuss together what could we do in order to make this a feasible strategy. Um, and in a way, the feasible strategy became the kind of maybe in between a light and a thorough renovation where um, we started to think what would be the least possible that we could do, what could be the smallest intervention. And what was very interesting about this process is that we started to really discuss about what small things would start to add up to something which would create value. Um, and these are sometimes unexpected things. So obviously um, something that is obvious was to change the relation, to change the ground floor, to open it up and to make it relate to the public space. Other things was to start to program it with different programs, like to have offices, to have a hotel, to have co-working space, to add a public rooftop again. Um, Next week the Hoxton coming from London is opening yeah. in this building. And so, um, so a bit of London in Brussels. Another thing that was surprising was that actually this facade, this very iconic facade of open and closed, if you start to look at what you want in solar gain, this kind of 50% open closed facade was actually perfect. Per per perfect. So in a way, um, we started to learn or to reappreciate the building also from different perspectives because architecturally we like this, but this is not enough. Like the, for instance, the argument of the solar gain was so suddenly an argument that could convince new tenants to come. Or for instance, the fact that this building doesn't change its appearance, so the, the change at the top, at the bottom, for the city, it means that it's a renovation and it's not a new building. So suddenly the procedure, which is notoriously long in Brussels, you could shorten it with a year and, and a half, half or something. Yeah. Um, so, so this is the record holder between design and permission, only because of refurbishment. And, and so suddenly the, 
the whole discussion started to become a discussion where it was not us trying to defend what we believe as strongly and as uh, uh, almost violently or fiercely as possible towards the developer, but really to say that this is a kind of temporary common ground that we share. We somehow all believe that this building is a valuable asset to keep, to develop, has met, and we started together with them somehow to compose with different values and to start to share values and what is, what is the thing that you think is, makes sense and what, what do we think makes sense and also to be ready to give up on some of the things that yeah, somehow got stuck in, into your minds um, very, um, you know, very quickly actually. Um, and so it's a situation where you start to make knowledge together and um, this making knowledge together is actually much more difficult than you would think. Um, obviously, we know the image of the architect who is the integrator, the synthesizer, someone who connects the engineers, etc. But in this situation, we feel it still to be rather different. Um, because it's not that uh, you have a kind of common goal and you integrate people towards that goal. It's actually that you don't have a common goal and you have to invent it together. And you have to be ready to say that common goal is something that we pull from different angles. It's about social value, it's about ecological value, it's about also financial value. And so this value model that you're creating is actually the architecture. And what we have learned, and which, has, which we think is very important, is that if you're somehow caught between those different perspectives, and um, is that you have to be able to be in the moment. So in a way, the, the way these buildings were made in a top-down way is also something that we should change in the practice. So also, we believe very strongly that we should find models of collaborating which put people in their full autonomy and in full connection with others. So if you're stuck in between these kind of different perspectives, it's very important that you are able to act and to react. And so to be somehow not a logical thinker, not someone who says, okay, that's the purpose, let's go there very rationally, let's try to be efficient, because in the, those circumstances, somehow efficiency doesn't exist. You only can try to do the best possible, and you have to do it with your whole heart and soul and competences. And in that sense, we believe somehow that if we want to work towards transformation, we have to change the way how we think what architecture should do, because somehow architecture, if you, this is a list of possible thought forms. So if you think, if you start to think, if you have a conversation with yourself, or if you have a conversation with others, there's multiple ways you can think about something. And if you start to look at that list, I think you, we have to admit that architects are somehow sadly stuck at the bottom of that list. They are very good at looking at the environment as something static, and you add a piece to it, and then you think that it will stay like this. But actually, the challenge that we have ahead is much more a transformational challenge, where changes have to happen both on the built environment, but also on production values, circularity, also on, let's say, what you expect. And so if we would, could go from a context and a part, let's say, a building, towards an integration of multiple perspectives, that, that is really something that we aim for and that we would like to discuss together with you. Obviously, to think in 28 different ways, I would uh, yeah, somehow challenge anyone to do it. It's, it's obviously impossible. And that's where it becomes very important to think about it together. And that's where the collective starts to play a role. So to, we have to invent new ways of creating collectives and to focus on our in interdependency. And that's what we try to organize in the office, saying let's stop thinking about projects as the, the thing that should always be excellent, should always be the most amazing thing, but let's relax about projects and somehow see what is possible in a given situation. For instance, with the IBM tower, let's keep the facade. It's, it will add so much value not to stress about that, that we can focus on other things. And to shift, in a way, our question to programs. And programs are for us uh, somehow area, areas of concern, areas of common concern, where there's questions that we want to share and where we want to start to integrate value. And 
when we talk about value, we obviously start to talk about business cases. So from a project to a program means becoming a part of a group that investigates, that starts to create knowledge, that starts to put that knowledge together. Every kind of project is an exercise towards something that could grow quickly. And almost the goal is to accelerate the exercises rather than to make excellent results. So from the best project to the best possible one. Yeah, indeed. Um, in that sense, the way how we define these programs, which I showed at the beginning, is to a certain extent rather abstract. Um, but all in their own right, they are um, not only talking about the topic that you want to deal with, but also try to make relationships with the people that, would, uh, that you could make an alliance with to start to talk about these uh, topics. And so that to make somehow circles beyond the circle of your own office of people that slowly become like-minded, that slowly start to have a common interest, a common concern of reaching something together. And obviously when you talk about infrastructure or if you talk about housing, these are very different circles of people. Um, and yeah, that's somehow the challenge that we see, that we see ahead. And thinking about these programs also made us realize that um, to somehow navigate risks, um, it's also important that um, we start to multiply our offers. So we, we st have started to see 51 n 4 as a platform um, that has different studios, for instance, ACT, CAST, ROOT, maybe these are more traditionally expertise-driven um, offices which offer services to clients. But other initiatives are of a very different nature. For instance, uh, Recast is a close collaboration that we have started to set up with an um, engineering company. And a developer. Um, start to invest in research together. Lab North is an alliance with the owners and developers of the North District to commonly invest. We invest our expertise, they invest their spaces, for instance, to start to think of the future of the North District together. And a very interesting one, personally, I find is Maison Nord, which is the office we hold. We managed to um, secure a lease for 12 years of the old train museum in Brussels, which uh, looks like this. Um, so this is the old museum space, uh, which is abandoned for, I think, 15 to 20 years now in the heart of the North Station. So it's actually here. Um, so this is the World Trade Center. We are now in this building. And in the, with that project, so our goal is to set up an office, which is also an atelier for others, and it's also spaces for um, third parties to come and convene people from the neighborhoods, local associations, and to somehow recreate that hub that we have found uh, in the World Trade Center with more stability, but with the, with, the, with the same purpose of basically creating that kind of place together where exchanges and where confrontation, but also proximities can, can happen naturally. Obviously, with that kind of space, we are in too many roles at once, like we are the investor, because we pay the refurbishment ourselves, we are the organizer of the events, we do the renovation, we started to source the materials from, the, from buildings close by that have been demolished. And it's, it's fully in the making, but it really um, puts on the agenda the question of reorganizing the practice in order to deal with the challenges ahead. And just like we did with the building, to unravel it in different processes, we see a real question of unraveling the practice and being able to ve be very agile and very fluid in what kind of position you take. And all of this comes with being on site, uh, with living in that space. So we have chosen the North District as our base, and it has become much more than that. It's the place where we actually live, um, where we have parties. This is a, an image of um, an office party uh, during the summer. And so it allows us to see a situation from many different angles and from many different perspectives. And yeah, that's maybe where I would like to end. Thank you.